Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Abraham Lincoln, in the opening sentence of what later became known as the House Divided Speech in the middle of the Civil War in the United States, made the statement that if we could first know where we are and whether we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. My contention this morning is that when it comes to conservation, we don't have a good grasp of where we are, nor of where we are going. There are literally tens of thousands of publications about the decline in biodiversity, changes in ecosystem services, and literally everything on the planet. Human numbers, as we know, continue to increase exponentially. And because of that, everything else on the planet, literally everything else on the planet is changing as well. The energy cycle is different to what it was 100 years ago. Life's crucible, described by E.O. Wilson, in which evolution occurred, is no longer the crucible that it was. Climate, in all of its aspects, has changed dramatically. All biogeochemical cycles have changed, and the number of novel chemicals on Earth is, increases daily. Electromagnetic radiation, biodiversity loss, niche diversity, soil dynamics, and so on. I could fill up a dozen slides on, on all of the things that are now different. The thing about all of these changes is that we have a very, very poor understanding of the consequences. We barely know how two or more of, of these factors interact. Elevated carbon dioxide is, is just one example. It's only in the last 10 years or so that we've come to realize that increase in atmospheric CO2 also influences photosynthesis of different um, photosynthetic pathways differently, so it influences species composition and so on. But we have a very shallow grasp of how all of these changes affect life on Earth. Add to this that historically, the management of ecological processes is essentially a litany of simplistic, superficial attempts at control. The history of conservation management has more failures in it than successes. And yet we pay very little attention to those failures. We tend to overlook them and pretend that they don't exist. Just one example of, of uh, the thing that I was involved in most and the elephant culling debate. Observation that elephants destroy trees and impact biodiversity, easily observed. Everybody knows about it. And everybody has an opinion about the solution being to reduce elephants to low numbers and that will present biodiversity loss. The problem is, is that the behavior of the system is nonlinear and so at low elephant densities, the losses are higher than they are at high density. So culling elephants doesn't actually reduce biodiversity loss. As a second example, I could not ignore what I'm sure will become known as man's greatest folly, what we're living through at present, the so-called COVID-19 pandemic. The solution of, of lockdowns wearing masks, all of those kind of things is easily demonstrated to be ineffective, ineffective in the stream and to actually have uh, effects different to what one expects. Back in the 1980s, culling was a major part of 
the management of large mammals in particularly the Kruger National Park. A workshop was held in elephants to discuss the effects of culling and in the forward to the, the uh, publication from that workshop, Graham Corley and, and Brian Walker wrote the following. The world is not simple and things are not always as they seem. In many instances, the obvious management response to a problem is not appropriate. It may even produce an effect directly opposite to that intended. This reflects the inherent difficulty in establishing cause and effect re relationships in complex, poorly understood systems. That was back in, in 1983, and it's really strange how little cognizance we give to this statement. It's worth reflecting on. The, this is just a small part of a, a larger statement. Management fails because our understanding of complexity is very weak. We are not good at identifying key components and links in systems, fast and slow variables, the drivers and responders and in, in systems. We don't identify lags easily. We don't affect, we don't identify feedback and feed forward processes, scaling effects, spatial and temporal effects. We don't identify emergence easily or cascades or autocatalysis and so on and so on and so on and so on. We really don't understand complexity well. We tend rather to regard it as uh, system science and complexity is much, much, much more than than system science. It's very much more complex than, than the analysis of abstracted systems that we're used to dealing with. How do we change this though? Really, restructuring, restructuration of the epistemic environment is the only solution. What's the epistemic, epistemic environment? Epistemology, as you will recall from your philosophy one lectures, is the science of how we know what we know. It is influenced, the, the, the environment is influenced by our uh, cognitive biases, the tools that we have available to us for analyses, what we perceive as being science, and so on and so on. There are many, many things that influence the epistemic environment. To change that, though, requires a lot. There are examples in history of where uh, restructuration has, has happened. One of the largest was the transition from Roman to Arabic numerals in, in Europe. In the ninth century, the Arab mathematician Al Khurizimi, Khurizimi was uh, the person that, that invented Arabic numerals, so to speak. It took nearly 300 years before people in Europe began to use them, another 400 years before they became into common use. But that single restructuration changed all of society on earth today. Uh, the age of Age of Enlightenment began because of it, the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and so on, all began as a consequence of the transition to Rome, Roman numerals. Education really is the only way to, to improve our understanding of complexity. And it's not only the understanding of complexity that we need to change, it's the definition of ecology. In the modern world, ecology is sort of as something that people who work outdoors on living things do. It's much more than that. E.O. E. O. Wilson's idea of consilience is, is absolutely an essential part of what ecology should be. Just think of the situation that we're in at the moment. We, here we are at a conference where we can't actually get together face to face. Conservation practice has just undergone a massive reduction in the amount of funding available to it. And, and uh, we have little idea of how economics and virology connect. That is what consilience is about. The way we do science, we are convinced as scientists that we know how science works. Well, actually, we don't. If you read Stephen Wolfram critically and carefully, his new kind of science uh, based on computation theory is a very different way of doing things, and it is an absolutely critically essential part of understanding complexity. 
Wolinski and Papert are, are convinced that a strong familiarity with agent-based modeling will help develop an understanding of complexity. I agree with that. The relationship of mathematics to the real world is also something that is superficially understood, despite what physicists say, and so on. We could go on for years on, on this topic. I started with uh, a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and I think it's appropriate to end with one as, as well. At the end of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln mentioned that the dogmas of the quiet past were inadequate for the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise to the occasion. Think of the situation that we find ourselves in. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. Disenthrallment is a critical notion when it comes to science at the moment. We really are not practicing science the way that we should be. Take a look at the medical journals and medical publications being put out on viruses at the moment, if you doubt that statement. We do need to rethink how we do science, and it's not our country that we're going to save. It is an entire planet. Mr. Chairman.